Hello folks, welcome to celloprofessor.com. This is also my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. My name is Jamie Feist. I teach cello at Central Michigan University. If you feel so moved, please like and subscribe. It is much appreciated. Let's jump right in. Fasten your seatbelts, folks, because we are talking about string crossings today on the cello. Different ways to execute them. The first way that we will talk about is the fast string crossing. When we think of fast playing, we usually think of the left hand, you know, the fingers zipping up and down the fingerboard, and we forget that we actually need a fast bow arm, all right, to keep up with those fingers, particularly when executing string crossings. So we'll see passages like things like that, last movement hide and see, or the Piatti Caprice number one. Something like that. And then we got, um, you know what I really like to give is the Rick Mooney Book 2, Thumb Position, uh, thumb, Thumbs of Steel, that's what it is, Thumb Position Book 2. Something like that. Okay, so yeah, fast string crossings. Now here's the thing, how do we execute fast string crossings like that? Well, first of all, remember, you don't want to try to do this with your whole arm. A lot of student cellists are one-trick ponies when it comes to their string crossings. All they do is move the whole arm. There's no way you're going to do those string crossings trying to move that much mass that quickly. So we need to not use the whole arm. Okay, well, what are the options? Well, one option is the wrist. I could just, you know, just move my wrist. And there are cellists that do that. You know, that has a long tradition in cello playing. That has been challenged, though, largely on grounds of you can hurt yourself. I mean, that's a lot, that's kind of taxing to do an active wrist motion. By the way, you, you may want to check out my video on passive and active and passive motions and also um, developing a relaxed wrist. OK, because that that what I'm talking about now relates very much to that. So some people use an active wrist motion. I personally don't use that. I don't like that very much. I think that will put you um, more at risk for some overuse injuries right in the wrist area here. And also I don't like it because if you look carefully here, it changes the angle of the stick. You know, it's like flat here and then it curves it, or not curves it, tilts it. All right, if you do it the way I'm gonna show you, the angle of the bow stays the same. So what am I talking about there? All right, one wonderful thing about the shoulder joint is that it's a ball and socket joint. Thank goodness for that. Because if it were not, playing the cello would be extremely difficult. It were, if it were more like a hinge joint, like the uh, elbow. No, you can move it in many different ways. And one way we can move it is we can rotate it like this, right? This rotational movement allows for a change of level, doesn't it? So that you can have a string crossing. Look at that, with the dipping motion. Good, a dipping motion in the, in the form. When I was an undergraduate at the University of Illinois, my teacher, Lorian Laufman, showed me this right away, and it was a game changer, folks. All right, it's a game changer. Because it's much easier to move your arm quickly around a pivot point like that in the upper arm than it is to move the whole arm and it's less taxing than the wrist because you are using larger muscle groups, okay? So, how does this work? So this is basically the motion. It's a combination of robot wave, as I call it. I do the robot wave for the vibrato too. You can always check out my video on that. But you can do the robot wave in this arm too. It kind of looks like a robot wave, doesn't it? Combine the robot wave with the door on the hinge. Robot, door. Robot, door. Combine them and you get a stir the cake. That's what my teacher, Lorian Loveman, used to call it at the University of Illinois. Stir the cake. Short for stir the cake batter, you know? There you go, y'all bakers. Stir the cake. Now, the cool thing about this is you can go, for me, this is counterclockwise. For you, that is clockwise. And you can also go clockwise, clockwise, and counterclockwise. I suggest you just do this motion off the cello. You need to get used to using your rotator cuff muscles a little more cellist, right? It's so, so handy, okay? And the external rotator cuff muscles tend to be weak in people anyway, so it's good to kind of tone them up a little bit. Okay, so there you go. It's basically this. Now, let me show you a couple, uh, 
things about the, the clockwise and counterclockwise. That's what I wanted to say. So now, if I go, for me that's clockwise. Looking at it, it should look counterclockwise because it's backwards. But I find that works really well for fast string crossing. Is to go the clockwise motion. When you go counterclockwise, it's a little slower, but you can get a little more in the string, you know? You can really bring out the bottom uh, note of it, which is kind of nice. Sorry, there's a little out of tune there, but if you want to really fly, right, then you go clockwise, counterclockwise. The down bow goes against the curve of the bridge. The curve of the bridge is this way. The down bow goes against it. When I go clockwise, it goes with the curve of the bridge. Counterclockwise, it goes against the bridge, meaning the down bow. And the clockwise is with the, with the curve of the bridge. It goes lickety split, folks. Lickety split, if that's what you'd like to do. So it really depends on what you're after, right? It really just depends what you're after. So that's that one. Learn your stir the cake, folks. Combo of dipping, robot wave, and door on a hinge. You put them together and you get your stirring of the cake. Any other, yes, here's the other aspect uh, of the dipping. A couple more um, items I need to cover. Now, when you're doing this, you know, um, stir the cake thing, you need to have a passive wrist motion, all right? So you'll want to look at my videos on the passive wrist motion. So what I like to do is, give me a second, I've got a pencil right down here. First, take your arm, rotate it like this, make it smaller and let the wrist go. This is a passive motion, folks. I will link to other videos and pages on my website where you can learn more about this. Hold the pencil in your hand. See if you can also get your hand to flop around like that. Then take your bow, flip your fingers, wrap your fingers around the tip here, loop them around rather, and then go like this. This is similar to that Paul Roland thing, right? Violinists, don't they do this? Didn't Paul Roland like wrap it around the pinky and then he'd have the violinist go like that? Okay, so you can just do it like this on the cello. Get that hand to sort of flop around a little bit. All right? Makes such a difference, makes such a difference. And also another key aspect to uh, string crossings is you don't have to bow, like you don't have, watch this. Look how big that is. Look how big that is, but look how small this is. Right, tiny. That's because when I'm playing fast, I'm gonna bow on the left side of the top string. I mean the right side, sorry, right side of the top string and the left side of the bottom string. And that makes it close. I'm not gonna bow on the left side of the top and the right side of the bottom. Alright, that's just way too much energy. I'm gonna keep it small. Okay, so for quick playing. Or for really any playing. You know, by the way, this motion too with the um the dipping. If you ever have a um, just sort of long bows where you have to doodle back and forth. You can just keep your elbow up and dip the whole way. Now notice, as I come to the tip of the bow, my motion gets bigger. And when I'm out here, this motion is bigger and that motion is smaller. When I'm at the frog, this motion is smaller and that motion is bigger. Oops, sorry. And now I'm suddenly not doing it very well, of course. There's also using gravity with the fingers. What do I mean? So when you're at like the frog, let's say, I think I should move back this way to make sure my whole bow is in there. I think it's, yeah, there it is. Okay, so like when I'm at the frog here, the tip of the bow, right, wants to fall because of gravity. So you can allow it to do that. And look at that, folks. We have a string crossing, right? So what you can do is just allow these fingers just to kind of bend passively, just kind of go along with it. You know what I mean? To go the other way, I have to use a little more of an active motion back down again. But this is really handy. Like if I go, see that? If I go to the top string, you notice my upper arm knows nothing of this string crossing. I'm actually even dipping a little with my wrist, actually. 
I'm actually dipping a little with my fingers now that I'm looking at it in my <laughs> in my iPad here. <laughs> right, going both ways there. So you can kind of do it with your fingers. So though that's this one, right? Just a little. Where would you use this one, by the way? Well, you kind of use. Right. But you see what I'm doing is watch my born, please. My upper arm knows nothing of the string crossing. It's doing a whole That's it. I like to do elbow up, elbow down. Right? So what it's doing is elbow rises, which actually helps prepare for the string crossing. My arm will zip up this way for the top string, so it's going to rotate up. Elbow goes back down, and then I do that motion I just showed you. Is, is not done at all with the upper arm, unless you want to consider the rise of the elbow, excuse me, the rise of the elbow as part of the string crossing. All right, so that's how you can utilize this particular type of string crossing. How about that, folks? That's all I have for today. So happy practicing, and I'll see you at the next video. All right, take care, folks. Ciao.